All right, boys and girls, guess who's back? It's time to talk about the best games that I played last year, and I've got a lot to... I'm sorry, what, huh? I, I, I never made a list for 2019. Huh. So, uh... Hmm. I guess maybe we should talk about 2019 first, then. 2020 was a garbage year for everybody, so why even talk about it, right? Why not talk about another year entirely, since I failed to do it last year? Who even cares? What does it matter? No one's gonna watch the video anyway. I can talk about my favorite games from 2010 if I wanted to. Nobody can stop me! But seriously, 2020 was also a garbage year for me in terms of video output. I maintained our second channel research runs pretty decently, considering all factors involved, and we put out some playthroughs that I'm proud of, but the main channel has been languishing for far too long. Time to change that. More videos is better anyway, so screw it. We'll do the 2020 list in a few weeks. For now, it's time to talk about 2019, I guess. Unlike my 2018 list, I actually played enough games to populate a top 10 list in 2019. No more silly ranking by percentage completion this time around. We're gonna rank them by straight quality and how much I enjoyed each game like a normal person would do, baby. The 10th entry on my list actually goes to two games because I really didn't feel like ranking one of them above the other. Kingdom Hearts 3 and Call of Duty Black Ops 4. My other reason for putting them in the same slot is because I have deeply mixed feelings about both of them. It's complicated. We'll talk about Kingdom Hearts first, though, because I'm generous like that. Kingdom Hearts 3 is one of the best games I've ever disliked. I think a lot of people assume that I went into the game with my expectations set too high, but to be honest, my expectations were kind of at rock bottom. I felt that a lot of Kingdom Hearts 3's best moments and ideas were still inferior to previous entries in the series, but despite that, since I wasn't really expecting much of anything, I was still perfectly willing to enjoy them for what they were, to take the game on its own terms and have a good time. And for the most part, I did have a good time. About half of the game is legitimately enjoyable, and the other half that I felt was kind of below average, honestly, its biggest crime is just being a little bit boring. The game has a lot of dry sections, and even these aren't bad, per se. They just felt like something you really had to power through and try to find the fun where you could, as opposed to something you were really savoring. We need to make our fun, damn it. Those <laughs> short kings. On the whole, Kingdom Hearts 3 had some fun peaks and some boring valleys, but again, I was willing to stick with the game and just have fun with it despite my apprehensions and what I felt the game could have been accomplishing if it had been trying a little bit harder. It's a fun, mostly well-made video game, and I'm sure that whenever I get around to playing it again, I'll have fun with it again. I'll probably have even more fun with it since I'll, you know, know more of what to expect. That being said, the ending of this game and some other aspects were just too much for me. I honestly, sincerely could not believe what I was witnessing at times. It wasn't that the game didn't meet some unrealistic expectations I held, it was that it was worse than my worst expectations. Kingdom Hearts 3 had me, it lost me. It reeled me back in, it kicked me in the balls. I honestly don't think that Kingdom Hearts 3 is a bad game. I had a good time with it overall, and like I said, one day I'll replay it and still have a good time, but the parts of this game I dislike just leave such a bad taste in my mouth that it really sours the entire experience when I don't stop and think about it dispassionately. At least the spaceship building is fun. Black Ops 4, meanwhile, I hadn't purchased a Call of Duty game since Modern Warfare 2, and it was only after a free trial weekend of this game and getting my hands on its Battle Royale mode that I decided to get the game on deep sale and give it a serious whirl. I don't regret it, Blackout was a ton of fun, and I even played a decent bit of the standard multiplayer, the, um, uh, headless chicken style of play popularized in the COD series from the first Black Ops onward has never really appealed to me. It's just a bit too frantic, a bit too chaotic. I feel like I'm always doing the exact same thing, and I can't say that this game changed my mind. It was more of a fleeting distraction. With the exception of Gun Game. Ooh, Gun Game, I always have so much fun with this kind of stuff. This is where the frantic pace of these more recent Call of Duty games actually works for me. Instead of falling back on one style of play, a submachine gun or whatever for an entire match, and the whole thing just turning into white noise, you're constantly changing up what you're doing, and the pressure to keep up with those around you and constantly adapt is so much fun. Getting into close matches, desperately struggling with other players in the lead to try and race for that last melee kill to win the round, so much fun. I could honestly play this every single day. Except, of course, that I can't, because it isn't part of Black Ops 4's standard rotation. And this is where the problems come in. I enjoyed a third of Black Ops 4. Blackout and one standard multiplayer mode. I don't give a crap about zombies, I don't care about the majority of the multiplayer suite, and at any given time, I could put the game in and find out that the modes I'm enjoying just aren't there anymore. All this battle pass garbage, rotating content, and new modes, it's supposed to keep you coming back for more to see what's new, but 
honestly, it was the biggest nail in the coffin for me with this game. More than once, I reinstalled this game to get back into it after a little bit of time away, only to boot it up and discover that I wasn't interested in any of the modes that were in rotation and uninstall the game shortly after. Considering how long it takes to install a damn game these days, the prospect of spending a couple of hours just to boot the game up and find out if I want to play it today is more than enough to turn me off. Same thing happened with Warzone. Oh man, I mean, seriously, I loved the large map TDM stuff in Warzone. I was so into that. Then bam, no more. It's out of rotation. It doesn't exist anymore. The last time I installed Warzone, I was suddenly level one again because a new game had come out and I didn't even recognize half the UI elements. The playing video games should not be this annoying or stressful. I still had enough fun with both Kingdom Hearts 3 and Black Ops 4 that it would have felt a bit unfair and dishonest to not include them in a list of fun games that I played in 2019, but boy, do they really make themselves hard to like. After spending some time with The Witness and its sometimes frustratingly specific and obtuse puzzles, I can understand why some people didn't care for it, but it's also a game I've got a lot of respect for. The simplicity of its design and controls, combined with a world that felt fun and rewarding to explore, made for a really relaxing experience for the time that I spent with the game. I didn't finish it, so I'm not qualified to judge it as a complete experience, but the time that I spent with it was fun. I only had to use a guide twice, and both times it was because I'd already solved the puzzle, but couldn't figure out the exact pixel that the game wanted me to stand on. While that was obviously annoying, I think the fact that I never needed or wanted to look up a guide for a complete puzzle solution is at least an indication that I was having a good time. Oh boy, we're three games into this list already, and I'm really piling on the praise, aren't I? Let's hope this gets better soon. On my 2018 list, I included the remaster of Final Fantasy XII, one of my favorite games of all time, but I kept it to the number 8 slot because I felt that ranking it higher would have been kind of unfair, so the number 8 slot is where a remaster of another one of my favorite games, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, is gonna have to live too. Call of Duty 4 still has annoying problems, like the fact that so many encounters are built around infinitely spawning enemies, but most of those problems melt away in the face of everything the game does well. So much of it is so well executed that sometimes it feels like every other shooter is still trying to be this game. It's just excellently paced, with levels that frequently change up what you're doing, and shooting that still feels more fun and responsive than a lot of other stuff on the market now. The campaign walks a tightrope act between being a legitimately exciting thriller and being a pretty biting commentary on a lot of aspects of modern warfare. Looking back now, the fact that the game is titled Modern Warfare seems pretty comically generic, but the game actually has a shocking amount to say about Modern Warfare, especially by the standards of a 2007 video game. I never needed a remaster of the campaign of this game, but it is so nice to actually have populated, non-hacked lobbies for this game again. The map design of COD 4 is so tight, and there are so many different ways to approach the game, different tactics and playstyles that all feel valid and rewarding. After 10 years of everybody ripping off the leveling progression of this game, it was starting to feel a bit stale, but that being said, now that every game I boot up forces me to stare down battle passes and star cards and whatever the hell all of this is, turning on COD 4 and shooting a guy with a gun and then getting a thingy that I can put on the gun? Masterpiece video game design. What if there was a cooking show, but instead of the chefs having to go to the pantry to get the ingredients they needed, they had to all kill monsters? Battleship Brigade is more than the sum of its parts or in this case, it's ingredients, I guess. The beat-em-up aspect of the game is fine, the puzzler cooking aspect is fine, but combined together, they make a whole new thing. Doing your basic Connect 3 rotation puzzle is fun, and Battleship Brigade tries to throw in some twists here and there to make the formula feel different from all the other bejeweled likes you've surely played by now, but the real fun is looking at the timer and asking yourself, do I have time to run back to where that particular monster spawns, kill it, 
pick up its guts, carry them back here, cook them into this dish, and still put the finished plate in front of the judge before time runs out. The animation work is slick, there are a lot of mini-games that really take the mechanics farther than you might expect, the main character's a lot of fun, the heck, the supporting cast is fun too, you can- I, I didn't even put it in a script, there are other playable characters in the game, the game has freaking head-to-head -head competitive multiplayer stuff in it, just cause why not, I guess? It's kind of, um, Top Chef. But for dogs. Congratulations to David Bowie, finally starring in a good video game to make up for Omicron. I'm proud of you, man. Wargroove is another game in the long, proud tradition of Nintendo won't make this damn game anymore, so I guess we'll just do it ourselves. This game is chasing after the shadow of the Advance War series. I've heard from some people who are way more into tactics games than I am that Wargroove apparently has some balance and game design issues that I'm just not attuned enough to notice, but... Uh... I don't know, I had fun. I did wind up having to bump the difficulty down in Act 4, but by doing so, I never stopped having fun with the game, so take that as you will, I suppose. This game is pretty feature-rich. It's got a story campaign, an arcade mode, this weirdo puzzle crap multiplayer, but best of all, it has built-in custom content creation features. Not only can you design your own maps and battles, but you could construct entire single-player campaigns, complete with world maps, cutscenes, event triggers during fights. There are so many tools on offer here that if you wanted to make a one-to-one -one recreation of the game's actual official campaign, you could get pretty close. People have recreated entire Fire Emblem games within Wargroove. If I'd been so inclined, I could have created this entire section of the video within Wargroove. Wargroove is fun, man. It's got a ton of content right there when you boot the game up, and pretty good community support too, so give it a look if you're into tactics games, or even if you're into game creation tools and you want to make something cool. I had played Final Fantasy IX before 2019, but I'd never beaten it. Actually, I didn't beat it in 2019 either, but I got further than I'd gotten previously. Playing Final Fantasy IX on stream with Joey was a pretty magical experience, even if we didn't manage to get all the way through before we got indefinitely sidetracked with other projects. Final Fantasy IX has a lot of strengths, and I think if you asked its biggest fans why it's their favorite, they're probably gonna gush about the main characters, Zidane, Garnet, Vivi, all of these characters who have their vulnerabilities, who open up and learn things throughout the course of the story. Characters like Freya show up, and you're like, ooh, that's my favorite, she's really cool. Cool. I want to see more of her, and then you hang out with her for like 10 hours before the game deletes her for the next 20, and by the time that she comes back, the writers kind of forgot what they were doing with her, and no one bothers to go back and check their notes. Suffice to say, I don't think the game handles its ensemble cast as well as it could have, but it gets enough right that you can forgive its missteps. It's got such a distinctive art style and soundtrack, and a lot of genuinely humorous moments to keep you going, but for my money, the thing that makes this game work so well, it's the relentless forward momentum, the willingness to change up what it's doing and to leap from a cute dance number to the Covenant showing up to Glass Reach. Wild stuff happens in this game, and it transitions between fairy tale logic and moon man logic pretty frequently and sometimes quite literally, but it always feels like you're getting pushed somewhere, like something is happening and the story is actually changing up, instead of the plot spinning its wheels or the characters arbitrarily walking to the next map to grind levels and wait for something to happen. In this game, slowing down and relaxing doesn't mean that the momentum stops, because relationships are changing up, we're learning things, the scenario is moving. Compare this game, which doesn't bother to explain pretty much anything, but is always trying to entertain you and throw new objectives and obstacles at our heroes, to RPGs where characters spend hours explaining things that the writers think the audience desperately needs to understand, but absolutely nothing ever actually happens. Alternatively, RPGs that are pretty sedate for most of their runtime, just to have one or two wild things that change up the scenario throughout the entire 40-hour adventure. Final Fantasy IX certainly has its slow points, it has some underdeveloped characters here and there, but it manages to be driving and urgent, always pushing characters from one objective to the next, while also being this relaxing fairy tale set in a cozy world with fun characters who have time to goof off. It's an excellent balancing act, great stuff. I'll finish it someday, maybe, I guess, who knows. Okay, it's it's been so long now since I should have made this video that I don't quite remember what's going on here, but there must have been a reason I didn't include Smash Ultimate on my 2018 list, right? I guess I didn't buy Smash until January of 2019, or 
Maybe I just didn't play it until 2019? Whatever. Smash Ultimate is great, you all know this. These games have always been famous for the wealth of options at your disposal, but Ultimate really takes it to another level with the massive number of gameplay variables and characters and stage variations. There is so much going on that you could honestly play this game forever. And, of course, my main problem with the series before this entry was finally addressed. Where's Daisy butt bread? Give us Daisy biscuit head! Under normal circumstances, I'd have no choice but to give this game a 10 out of 10 for that alone, but they didn't bring back Break the Targets, even though Battle Chef Brigade did that, so I'm afraid I can't rank it any higher than number four on my list. Sayonara Wild Hearts is a two-hour concentrated blast of video game perfection. There is no fat to trim here. There isn't a bad level in the game. You just turn it on, you have fun, it ends, and then if you're anything like me, you play it all over again. I honestly cannot remember the last time that I cared about pursuing high scores in a video game, but Sayonara got me to care. Sayonara Wild Hearts is short, it's infinitely replayable, it's a ton of fun, and it's cheap, so you have no excuse. Buy it and play it immediately. I have a confession to make, and this is going to be hard for some of you out there to hear. I was part of the problem. I didn't buy Titanfall 2 when it came out. But when I did buy it in 2019, I felt like Respawn gave me money. Let me give those of you who aren't familiar a little quick little rundown of this game, okay? So Matt Mercer gets pulled out of his D&D session, and he falls out of the sky and gets crushed by a robot. But then this guy gives him a robot, so he uses the robot to kill other robots. But then a crane steals his robot, so he has to go to a factory where he has to fight the floor. Then he finds this guy. This guy fought the floor too, but he didn't win, so Matt steals this thing off of his corpse. And then he has to use time travel to kill everyone in the past so they can't kill him in the future, okay? That was just three levels, by the way. There are levels in Titanfall 2 that feel like they could be the basis for an entire game, but they're treated as mere flirtations before whisking you away to the next awesome thing. It doesn't feel schizophrenic in that sense either, though, because it has such excellent pacing. Every idea is introduced, developed, and you spend just enough time with it to learn how it works and feel like you've mastered a new skill before you get to learn the next new thing. Like Sayonara Wild Hearts, I keep going back Back into this game's single-player campaign. It's just so much fun. The first-time play experience is especially gratifying, though it really feels like you are the character. You start out with all this equipment you don't really know how to use, and then you learn all these new mechanics and skills as the game goes on, until you get to the point where you're pulling off sick mid-air hip shots out of a wall run into a falcon near the face of some unsuspecting goon a mile below you. It's amazing. Please buy it. I need EA to greenlight a third game, please! Oh yeah, also, there's, uh, there's, there's also, there's also multiplayer, um, and in the multiplayer, they give you a a grappling hook that can hook onto any surface in the game. It's really good. And my favorite game I played in 2019. You already know that it was Persona 5. Who are you kidding? You already know the answer to this one. It game of the decade, Persona 5. Well, Jacob, have you watched this five hour long video about. Nope! Titan engaging combat, phenomenal music, great characters and atmosphere, an art style that punches you in the face and demands your attention. This game is a masterpiece. I spent over 150 hours with my very good best friends, and you better believe I'll spend another 150 with them in Royal whenever I find the time. I don't have another 150 hours to spend with them right now because there are more videos coming your way soon. I'm back with a vengeance. Nobody can stop me. Check out our second channel because we're going to play all the Uncharted games except for the stinky Vita ones. It's going to be a blast. New stuff happening soon too. So stay tuned. I'm not going anywhere this time unless there's a tragic accident or I get a job that takes too much of my free time. Bye!